this is what we're going to be creating in today's video. It's going to have a little bit more intermediate methods involved, but we're still going to be going step by step, which means it's going to be very easy to follow along. With that, let's actually begin the tutorial and learn how to link between multiple geometry node trees within the same object. In our default scene, we'll go ahead and bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and then change this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, after which we'll select the group input and tap X to delete it. Now we want a plane on which we'll instance a bunch of points. So we'll use a grid node and we'll simply distribute a bunch of points on this grid. So we'll press shift A and search for a distribute points on faces node. And we want to change this from random to Poisson disk so that there are no overlapping points. Now we can also increase the size of the grid over here. We'll maybe make it a three cross three grid and maybe we'll change the distance min to something like 0.2. Now that we have this, if you actually look at it from the top view, it's still in a square shape. It would be nicer if it was in a circular shape. And for that, you could have just used a circle. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete particles that are greater than a certain distance from the origin. So I'll press shift A and search for a position node, which will give me a vector that points from the origin to wherever the point is located. To delete all of these particles that have a position greater than a certain area, I'm going to use a vector math node and I'm going to change it to the property of length so that we simply get the length length of this position vector. Now we can compare this with a value by using a compare node and changing the second value to whatever distance we want. Since we have the size of this grid to be three meters, we can start increasing this to about half that size. Let's go with 1.5 meters. And that will be the radius for the circle that's deleted. If you increase the density max, you can see how it is a perfect circle. So let's keep the density max at something very low itself. We'll maybe stop at five for now. These points are what's going to be used to create create these really nice curves. So for now, we'll go ahead and convert these from points to actual vertices for the next modifier that we're going to use. So let's press shift A and search for a points to vertices node and plug that in after the delete geometry. And now we just have a bunch of vertices. Next, we can go back to the modifier stack and add in a new modifier. And this time we're going to choose the screw modifier. This screw modifier is essentially going to take those vertices and then rotate them about the origin or whatever axis you choose. And while it does that rotation, it also extrudes the points so that you get this particular curve. Now we can of course play around with these by increasing the actual screw size which will push it up on the z-axis as you can see like this. Let's maybe increase the size to something like five for now and then you can increase the number of iterations to just have that repeat multiple times. Of course this is again up to you. You could have this length to be whatever you want and that'll actually stretch this out or push it down accordingly. Apart from that if you actually take a look at this it's really jagged. You can clearly see the edges that make up this particular curve. To make that much smoother, you can go to this steps and start increasing that till you get something that's very smooth. So I think 100 will be smooth enough. So I'll change both the render and the view to 100 so that we get this nice smooth curve. Beyond that, if you want to increase the number of twists, you can increase this angle and that'll just increase the number of twists as you can see while maintaining the same height. Maybe I'll keep the angle at 360 itself. Now that we have this set up, we can go ahead and push this onto some particular curve. So let's create a curve by pressing shift and searching for a Bezier curve. Now this particular curve is going to be placed arbitrarily. Let's just push it to the location that we want. We'll press R Y 90 to rotate it on the Y axis by 90 degrees, followed by G Z to bring it up on the Z axis. Now we'll press tab to go into edit mode and we'll just select one of these handles and move them around by just pressing G and bringing them along different axes. Now it's really up to you as to where you want to position this and how you want to rotate it. But essentially you can scale it up to create smoother curves and you can rotate it about in all three axes. You can select the other one as well and just scale it up to make it smooth there as well. And then if you want, you can always extrude this even more by pressing E to create another variation. And you can just keep increasing the size of this just like that. Now remember, even this has to increase its resolution because right now it is really hard shapes. As you can see right here, it's very flat and you can see each edge. So let's smoothen that out by going to the object data properties and increasing the resolution up to maybe 120 and that should make it really nice and smooth. Now, of course, this curve that we've created is way too tall. So let's press tab to go back into object mode, select this and under the actual modifier tab, let's decrease the iterations down to one itself because that should be good enough for the animation that we're creating. Then let's add in another modifier, which is going to be the curve modifier. This will allow us to bend this according to wherever this particular curve is. So let's go down to the curve modifier and for the curve object, let's select that Bezier curve that we just created. Now, of course, this 
this axis might be incorrect. So let's go ahead and just change the deform axis until we get it to be formed around this particular axis, as you can see. Now, if you see that it's not filling up the entire length, you can always press GZ and move it along the Z axis so that it actually fits along the length. But apart from that, you might also want to increase the length by changing this screw length or by increasing the number of iterations. So maybe I'll keep the iterations at two and I'll just press Alt G to clear its location. And this should be good enough. Now that we have this set up, let's go ahead and add in another modifier to this time give it some thickness because right now, if we switch off overlays, nothing can be seen. So to give this some nice thickness, let's add in another geometry node modifier by pressing this plus button once again. Now we're gonna actually use the group input because that is the curve that we want to use. But right now it's a mesh. So let's press Shift A and search for a mesh to curve node. Now we can convert this curve back into a mesh by using a curve to mesh node. But this time for the profile curved, we can press shift A and search for a curve circle. Now, of course, if you want this to be nice and smooth, you can increase the resolution. You can keep it at 32. But for now, I'll just reduce the radius to 0.1 and plug that into the profile curve. Now I want this radius to change according to the position of an empty. So I'll press shift A and I'll search for a set curve radius node and I'll control this radius based on the position of an empty. So let's add in the empty by pressing shift A and searching for an empty plane axis. Then again, select the main cube object and then take this empty from the outliner, click and drag it into your geometry node workspace. Now we can switch from original to relative and then take the location and compare that with the X location of the position of these curves. So let's press shift A and search for a position node. And then let's also search for a separate XYZ node. Now we need to separate the XYZ for both the actual curve as well as this position. So let's duplicate this by pressing shift D. Now let's plug the position into this vector and let's plug this location into this vector. Now we need to compare the Z axis positions. So press shift A and search for a subtract node, which is actually just a math node switched from add to subtract. So now take this Z and plug it into the first socket, take this Z and plug it into the second socket. And now we need to actually decide on how this is going to affect this radius. Because right now, if we just plug it directly into the radius, you're going to see we get this this weird shape where it just keeps getting larger and larger. And here we have negative shapes that goes larger and larger. You can remove this entire negative region by just clamping it down. And that way only the things that are greater than zero or below this particular empty is going to be seen. However, this doesn't give us too much control. So I'm not going to use this clamp. And instead I'm going to use a nice map range node. So press shift A and search for a map range and plug that in after the subtract. Now I'm going to keep the from min as zero itself. The from max as one, but I'm going to start increasing this from max to create a really nice smooth fall off. Now let's make this something like 10 and that'll give us a really nice smooth fall off. But we have to press shift A and search for a color ramp node so that we can actually make it fall off on the other side as well. Right now, if you see this, it just gets larger and larger and eventually it'll stop at one, but it'll remain that height or that radius for the entire duration. So if we plug this in here, we can actually change this white socket to black as well, and then add in another stop in the middle by pressing this plus button and changing this one all the way to white. So that way we actually get a situation where it starts off thin, becomes fat in the middle, and then becomes thin again. To see this, we we can select this empty and just press G Z with the empty selected. And if we then move it on the Z axis, you can see how it nicely actually changes this particular radius according to its position. Now you can always change this from max to something like five to decrease the actual distances that become like this. And you can also increase or decrease the radius by increasing this white value from one to something even higher like two. And that way you can see it becomes even fatter. Apart from that, you can keep this value at one but instead on this profile curve, you can change the radius as well till you get something that you think suits your scene. Now I'm going to go with the radius of 0.2 here. And for now, there's a bit of overlap. So if you want to remove those overlaps, you can go back to the first geometry node tree by selecting this first node modifier over here and just increasing the distance min for this distribute points on faces node. So let's just increase this to maybe 0.4 and then you can see how many more are deleted and now there's no overlap. So that looks great, but we of course have to actually texture this. So for the texturing, let's see what the main issue is. If we were to go back 
to the final node tree to add in the materials because right now this node tree does not have any real mesh. We have to select this node tree over here, which is the fourth modifier. And over there, we can press shift A and search for a set material node. Now, after we set this material, we can't actually make changes to these individual strands to have different colors. If we were to go into the shader editor and then try and use different strands by using something like the object info node, you'll see that even by plugging the random into the base color, and switching over to a viewport chaining of render, we don't actually get variations in the colors for different strands. Everything just takes on this random gray color and it all shares the same grayness. So that's happening because right now these are not instances and this random would work for either different objects or for different instances. And since these are not instances, this will not work. So the way we overcome that is by going into the geometry node section once again, and within this node tree, before we set the material, or even if we set it afterwards, it's not an issue, but essentially we need to save or store some random value for the different points. So we can press shift A and search for a store named attribute and then plug that in right here and then press shift A and search for a random value and plug that into the value of this store named attribute. Now for every point, we're going to store a random value and we'll label this as something like random value or R-A-N-D-V. Now the reason why we're doing this for every single point is that remember, we initially created points only over here. So each of those points will get a random value and that same random value will be passed on to everything that was created from that particular point. And since everything is created from that point itself, all of them are going to have this same random value. So if we go back to the shader editor and then press shift A and search for an attribute node and then plug this color into the base color and actually search for the randv attribute you'll see that each spline is going to be getting one specific color only so that's absolutely what we wanted and now we can go ahead and just texture this according to what we want so let's search for a color ramp and we'll take this color and plug it into the factor. Now we can change this from linear to constant and just drag this in so that just a few strands will have a value of one and the others will all get a value of zero. So then we'll press shift A and search for a math node so that we can increase or decrease that value of one. So plug this in right here and change it to multiply. Now we'll multiply it by something like five just so that we get some nice bloom. Let's plug this into the emission strength and we'll also switch on bloom by going to our render properties, switch on bloom here and we'll also switch on screen space reflections then for the actual emission color we'll maybe make it white and maybe i want another color as well maybe a greenish color so i'll press shift a and search for another color ramp or i'll just duplicate this color ramp and then i'll press this plus button to add in a new stop and i'll just bring it halfway through this white region and maybe this one i'll give the other color that i want so let's actually go with a red color now let's take this same color output from here plug it into the factor and then take this and plug it into the emission. So now half of the ones that are white should end up becoming red. Now let's just drag this back so that even more of them are lit up. And along with that, we'll have to drag this back as well. So now you can have control over how many of these you want. And I think that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and just change our background color all the way to black. And let's delete this default light. And let's increase the metallic value of everything. And let's reduce the roughness down to maybe 0.3 so that we get some nice reflections as well. Now we'll We'll give it an object to reflect off of as well. So we'll just select the original Bezier curve that we have. We'll go down to the material properties. We'll add in a new material and we'll make this base color completely white and very, very reflective by making it completely metallic with a roughness value of 0.2. But obviously there's no actual surface for this Bezier curve to reflect. So let's give it a surface by going to the curve properties, expanding geometry and just increasing this bevel depth to something like 0.2 so that now there's a pipe running through the middle that actually reflects off the lights. So that looks good enough. But if you want, you could actually give this its own color as well by changing this base color from a white to maybe a blue or something like that. Even a green could work. So this way, all of the white reflections will take on that particular color, which I think looks pretty good. Now that you have that set up, let's go ahead and just finish off the animation. For the animation, we have to first set up the camera. So let's select the camera, press Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation. And now to actually see it, let's switch on overlays, press RX 90 and then zero on your numpad to go into the camera view. Now you can press GY to move it back and just move it to some place that you're happy with. You can move it up on the Z axis and just place it somewhere that suits your scene. Apart from that, you can also rotate it about to just give this curve some more 
of a random shape and you can move it on the local axis by double tapping the letter. So double tapping X will move it on the local X axis. So now that you're happy with the way everything is positioned, you can start the animation by selecting the empty and switching on all of the animation defaults. Let's go to the output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. End frame maybe we'll keep at 150 and you can choose the output folder as well as the file formats and everything according to your own preferences and what you think is suitable for your scene. Next, we'll expand the timeline a bit and on frame zero with the empty selected, we'll just press GZ and move it up on the Z until everything is outside the view or if you wanted to go from the bottom to the top, you can move it down on the Z until everything is outside your view on this side. So once you have everything outside your view, tap I and choose location. And then on frame 150, just press GZ and bring it up till it's completely out of your view in the top region as well. So that way you'll get somewhat of a perfect looping animation. So you can plug location and that's actually it. You can press T and make it linear so that it doesn't slow down and speed up during the animation and it moves with a constant speed. And if you want to see the actual frame rate at which it's going to be exported, change this playback from play every frame to frame dropping. And now you'll get a realistic idea of the speed of the animation. So that's actually all there is to creating this particular animation. If you're happy with the way everything looks, you can go ahead and press render animation. I hope that was an interesting one and the usage of different geometry node trees to create some abstract effects was actually useful. Of course, these techniques can be implemented in various other methods as well. And I can't wait to see how you use your creativity to create amazing renders. I post videos every single day. So until the next video comes out tomorrow, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.